Welcome to the Mulcahy Law Firm podcast. For over 25 years, Mulcahy Law Firm has helped plan communities and condominium associations throughout the state of Arizona. Please go to iTunes or your favorite podcasting platform and leave us a rating and a review. Thank you for listening. Here's Beth Mulcahy. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our 2022 virtual HOA Condo Academy for our class number seven for the month of July. Thanks so much for joining us here today to discuss topics for HOAs and condos in 2022. Uh, So happy that you could be here with us today. We're really happy to be here in partnership with the cities of Avondale, Chandler, Glendale, Mesa, Peoria, Phoenix, Scottsdale, Surprise, and Tempe. Welcome. My name is Beth Mulcahy, and I'm the managing partner and senior attorney for the Mulcahy Law Firm in Phoenix, Arizona. I've enjoyed representing HOAs and condominiums for over 25 years, and my firm currently represents over 1,000 planned communities and condominiums throughout the state of Arizona. I currently serve on my HOA board, and I have for many years. Before we dive into the meat of this seminar, I'd like to start off by getting a feel for who's in my audience today. The first question is, which city do you reside in? And then the second question is, let us know your current role in your association. Are you a board member, manager, interested homeowner, or other? And in a few minutes, we're going to be um, reading the results of this. So we're going to give a little time for it to come up. Okay, so first, what is on today's agenda? While we wait for those poll results to come in, let's talk about today's seminar. Hot Topics is one of my favorite classes to teach because we're able to cover a lot of territory on a lot of different topics quickly. And these topics typically are either new issues that may come up in our practice area or new problems that associations may have or maybe like cutting edge areas that are becoming questions for the future, or maybe we see it coming in the horizon. So in preparing to teach this class here today, what we decided to do was we took a look at the type of questions that come into our firm, number one. And then also we started to monitor various news sources in Arizona and around the country. We also have been attending a number of seminars pertaining to associations. We really try to give you a 360 view of what are the hot topics that pertain to associations right now. So now we're going to be returning to our poll results here shortly. So for our results for which cities are present here today, we have the cities of Avondale, Chandler, Glendale, Goodyear, Mesa, Peoria, Phoenix, Scottsdale, Surprise, and Tempe. Okay, let's switch gears and look at what's the percentage of people that are here, what positions do they hold, and what's their interest in the community. So we have 63% of the viewers that are here with us today are board members, 10% are managers, and we have 19% interested homeowners and 8% others. So we have a really strong representation today of board members, managers, and homeowners. So that really kind of um, gives us a good 360 perspective um, from all different angles of different people in our industry. So right now we have 160 people joining us here on Zoom this morning. Um, I can't believe that. I think this is an all-time high. The only other time that we had maybe a higher percentage was maybe like in March 2020 when we were in the knee deep in the, the pandemic. So thanks so much for being here today. I promise this is going to be a very worthwhile class for you. We also have a number of people joining us on Facebook Live this morning. So thank you also for joining us here as we navigate this presentation. Okay, the first hot topic we're going to be talking about is the Arizona legislature and what happened this year and what laws are going to be going into effect that are going to impact planned communities. So as you may have heard, our 2022 legislative session ended on June 24th, and it was one of the longest sessions in Arizona's history, lasting 167 days. Um, Arizona is unique in that we have a um, we don't have a full time legislature. Typically, legislature is only in session somewhere between three and six months each year. It was also one of the most active legislative sessions for HOAs and condominiums in the history of um, since I've been monitoring legislation for a quarter of a century. And so there were 25 bills introduced this year pertaining to HOAs or condominiums. 
And that's, you know, a record high, especially after the past two years where we've had very little legislation regarding associations. Ultimately, our governor, Governor Ducey, signed into law five bills, and we're going to take this as our first hot topic this morning. What are the new laws that are going to um, be impacting and applying to associations? So let's take a look at these new laws. House Bill 2131. Um, And this is talking about artificial grass and prohibiting associations from banning the use of artificial grass and associations. This law only applies to planned communities. So that's a very important distinction. And basically, the gist of the law is that planned communities cannot prohibit the installation or use of artificial turf or artificial grass on a member's property. There are some things that an association can do, however, to make sure that the artificial grass is maintained, etc. So a planned community can, however, adopt reasonable rules regarding the installation and appearance of the artificial grass, as well as its location on the property and the percentage of property that may be covered by using artificial turf. Additionally, an association can require the removal or replacement of artificial grass or turf if it causes a health or safety concern and it is not maintained in accordance with the reasonable rules established by the planned community. If the planned community's documents allow natural grass on a member's property after the time of developer control, the association cannot prohibit installing or using artificial turf on any member's property. But again, as I stated, the community can adopt rules regarding installation and appearance of the artificial turf. Um, just as long as those rules don't effectively prohibit or prevent installing artificial turf. And the location of the, on the property and the percentage of the property that may be covered with artificial turf can also be addressed in the association's reasonable rules. And so those are kind of some important checks and balances in place to make sure that whatever artificial turf is installed, um, you know, that it's maintained and then as their association has some ability to regulate it. A planned community can also require the removal of the member's artificial turf if the artificial turf causes a health or safety issue, as we stated above. And if it's not being maintained, the artificial turf, we can also have that. The association can also require that the member remove it. A planned community can prohibit artificial turf in a planned community um, in these situations. So there are a couple of exceptions, and these are the exceptions. If it's installed in an area that the association maintains or irrigates. So sometimes in an association, in a planned community, the common areas or the front yard areas that are actually on an owner's lot are maintained by the association, or maybe the association controls the irrigation on these areas. In those cases, the association can prohibit the installation of artificial turf. If a planned community prohibits the installation of natural grass on a member's property, the association can also prohibit the installation of artificial turf on a member's property, except that in, in that instance, an association may not prohibit a member from converting natural grass to artificial turf on a member's property. So obviously, that's kind of an obvious exception. If a court finds that a planned community or an HOA violates this law, a court has the ability or, or shall award attorney's fees and costs against the association. So there are some penalties if the association doesn't comply with this. One important thing to note is that if your association has unique vegetation and geologic characteristics that require preservation in which the viability of those characteristics is protected, supported, or um, enhanced, the result of the continuum it's needed to keep that NAOS area, for example, the association could prohibit having the installation of artificial turf in those areas. Okay, so that's the 411 on artificial turf. I have had a couple of associations previously to this law being introduced this year. Some members were unhappy with somebody placing artificial turf in their front in their neighbor's front yard or whatever. And in my experience, it has worked out just fine. But at first, people were opposed to it. But then when they saw how high quality it looked and how it looked nice 12 months of the year and after its useful life is over, it's replaced with something else and it saves water usage. It is something that is definitely things that associations are initially reluctant to allow, but after they start to see more owners doing it, they see the benefits of it. So if you're on this call today and you're concerned about a number of members installing artificial turf on their property, 
I have an open mind because in my experience, it has been a win-win for many associations. Okay, the next law that we're gonna talk about is House Bill 2158. And this talks about political activities, community activity within a condominium or a planned community. So this law applies to both condominiums and planned communities. And it states that an association cannot prohibit a unit owner or a member from peacefully assembling and using private or common areas of the community. The association may not restrict owners from posting notices of meetings on physical or electronic bulletin boards, such as like your website of the association for posting notices of board of directors, officials meetings. So basically what this law is saying is that owners can peacefully assemble to discuss issues. And if the owners want to put a notice on the association's bulletin board of these meetings where they're going to be peacefully assembling, the association has to allow them to put the notice of the meeting on um, you know, any place that the association would put their regular notices of meetings for board meetings or maybe even an annual meeting. Where are we going to see this come into play? You know, you never know. Um, but what I can tell you is I think probably a likely time that we'll see this is when we have owners that are upset about something. So maybe they want to remove the board from office and maybe they want to have a meeting to discuss it. Or maybe they aren't happy about a capital improvements project or a five-year plan for the association. Or maybe they're unhappy about an increase in the assessment rate or a special assessment, something of that nature. So what I anticipate is that we will start to see more peaceful assembly requests and maybe it'll just be informal and and they're just going to be meeting on the common areas. Important for the association to note that we can't prohibit that. Now, I think there is definitely a difference between a peaceful assembly of homeowner association or condominium members on the common areas versus like a a march or something regarding maybe a different issue where there's a lot of people coming in who don't live in your association. And I think that's, that's definitely a different situation, in my opinion, and it's not covered by this law. Okay, this bill also goes on to expand the definition um, of a political sign. And we're going to be talking about this as another hot topic a little bit later here today. But political signs are in full swing right now throughout Arizona with the primaries taking place with the, the national elections coming up in November. And so basically, this law also, in addition to addressing peaceful assembly, also talks about political signs. And it says that the political signs, of course, that are allowed under Arizona law displayed on an owner's property, those typically were reserved to federal, state, local elections or propositions that might be introduced. Well, this new law expands the ability of an owner in an HOA or a condominium to have a political sign on their property for any activity to elect or remove a condominium or a planned community director or in support or in opposition to a measure that requires a vote of the association membership. So basically, this bill also expands uh, political signs in a way that not only does it apply to state, federal, and local elections and propositions, but now it also is traversing over into talking about association issues. So election of directors, removal of directors, important association issues. Do I think that we're going to see some homeowners putting up political signs for association issues or election of association directors? I think it's going to be pretty few and far between. If you see this happen in your community after the effective date of these laws, um, you just need to note that owners are allowed to do this. Um, and we'll talk about the timelines for how long they can keep them up shortly. Okay, another thing that this bill is going to prevent is it will prevent the association from prohibiting or unreasonably restricting a unit owner's ability to peacefully assemble, as we talked a little bit before, if it's done in compliance with reasonable restrictions or the use of the property adopted by the board. If you're seeing a rise in owners wanting to peacefully assemble in your neighborhood, the board has the right to pass rules regarding those peaceful assemblies. So, you know, we have some sample rules if anybody's interested in, in seeing them. We're going to be releasing those either later this week or next week through our MLKG memo that we send out weekly. So um, stay tuned for those and, and we'll give you some examples of some things that you might want to consider. So House Bill 2010 is the third bill that we're going to be talking about here this morning. 
This bill, of course, is a bill in direct response to the the pandemic that we are hopefully winding down from. Um, And basically, this new law applies to planned communities and to condominiums, and it adds a first responder flag and a blue or gold star flag to the list of flags that an association may not restrict the outdoor display of. So a first responder flag is defined under the law as a flag that recognizes and honors the services of any of the following. So law enforcement, and that is limited to the colors of blue, black, and white, and the words law enforcement, police, officers, first responders, honor our, support our, and department, and the symbol of a generic police shield. Um, A first responder flag can also be defined as fire department flags, and that would be limited to the colors of red, gold, black, and white. The words fire, firefighters, FD, FD, first responder, department, honor R, and support R, and the symbol of a generic Maltese cross. The third type of first responder flags um, that would be covered by this new law would be paramedics or emergency medical technicians, and that's going to be limited to the colors of blue, black, white, and the words first responder, paramedic, emergency medical, service, technician, honor, our support, our and the symbol of a generic star of life. And so basically the first responder flag is just something that an owner wants to display on their property. They are allowed to display that now under this new law. Okay, uh, the last two laws we're going to be discussing were just passed a couple of weeks ago. The last two that came in under the wire, so to speak, after the budget was passed. The first law that we're going to be discussing is going to be dealing with condominium terminations. So this law is only going to apply to condominiums. It's not going to apply to planned communities. And it amends um, a section in the Condominium Act, sections 33.12.27 and 33.12.28. And basically, the gist of the law is talking about, you know, terminating a condominium, ending a condominium, and it gives some certain percentages, which are important for associations to know if you're one of those associations who may want to terminate your condominium. Um, One thing I'm going to mention is this is very rare that we ever see something like this. And it says that except in cases of amendments that may be executed pursuant to other sections of Title 33 of the CCNRs, including the plat, may be amended only by vote of the unit owners to which at least 67% of the voters in the association are allocated or any larger majority. Um, It talks about a condominium may be terminated only by agreement of 80% of the unit owners or any larger percentage if the declaration specifies. But there are two exceptions that you need to know about. In the case of taking of all the units by eminent domain, um, that is not going to be subject to this agreement of 80% of the unit owners. And also if the declaration specifies a smaller percentage but only if all the units in the condominium are restricted exclusively to non-residential uses. A condominium created on or after the effective date of this amendment to this section may be terminated only by agreement of 95% of the unit owners in the association or any larger percentage that the declaration specifies. So the bottom line on this new law is that once this section you know, the change to this section in the law is going to go into effect in September. Once that happens, a condominium can only be terminated by agreement of 95% of the unit owners in the association. Prior to that, it's still 80%. But again, this is kind of a limited thing. We don't see termination of condominiums very often. Okay, the last section is talking about short-term rentals and vacation rentals. This is a very hot bill for this year. Back in 2016, our legislature amended um, this requirements that cities used to be able to regulate short-term rentals through zoning and ordinances, um, and they would have certain areas zoned as transient housing, and if you weren't zoned as transient housing, which means nightly rentals, you weren't able to do nightly rentals. But in 2016, that law changed and took away the ability of cities, towns, and municipalities to regulate short-term rentals. And that was really a game changer for associations. And since that time between 2016 and 2019, it was really very apparent that this was a bad move. And there's a lot of unrest in many like resort cities like Sedona, where short-term rentals were just taking over the city. 
even the people that worked in Sedona weren't even able to find housing because so much of the housing had been converted to short-term rentals. Um, if you go back to that time, Governor Ducey said he was going to support legislation to fix the problem that was created by the 2016 legislation, which basically took away the city's ability to regulate short-term rentals. And then the pandemic hit, you know, in 2020, and we kind of had two COVID legislatures in 2020 and 2021. And so this issue really wasn't adequately addressed by the legislature. Well, this year, this legislative session, they have made some pretty large strides in addressing this. So this bill is Senate Bill 1168, and it sets forth the ways in which a city or town may regulate vacation or short-term rentals. And so these are some of the requirements that, um, you know, landlords that have short-term rentals will need to follow. So first, they are going to need to require the owner of a vacation or short-term rental to provide emergency contact information. The owner must provide emergency contact information to the city. And this contact person must be able to respond to any issues that come up on a short-term rental. The city or town can impose a penalty of up to $1,000 against the owner for every 30 days that they fail to provide the contact information. Um, the second part of how this bill allows for the city or towns to require the owner to obtain and maintain a local regulatory permit or license. And so each city is going to require that permit or license. In addition, their city or town is going to require before offering a big short-term rental for rent, for the first time, the owner must notify all single family residential properties adjacent to directly and diagonally across the street from the property. And so now it's putting the onerous on the landlord owner to notify the neighbors um, that, hey, this is becoming a short term rental. Um, the city or town also is going to require the owner of the property to display a local regulatory permit number or license number if any, on each advertisement for the vacation or short-term rental property that the owner maintains. And lastly, uh, the city or town is going to re require the vacation rental or short-term rental to maintain appropriate liability insurance to cover the vacation or short-term rental in the aggregate of at least $500,000 or to advertise and offer each rental through an online lodging marketplace that provides equal or greater coverage. Um, and so it's kind of interesting to see how this law has evolved since 2016. So it's, it's obvious to me that the legislature, um, the mandate is that we're going to be trying to hold these short-term rental landlords and owners in HOAs and, and client communities accountable. Um, and the way to do that is to get emergency contact information, make them to take out a permit, notify the neighbors that this is becoming um, a short-term rental property. Again, it's, it's just gonna be only at when the property is rented for the first time. Um, then they have to display the permit on each advertisement for the vacation um, or short-term rental property. And then they have to obtain liability insurance themselves, or if they're using a short-term rental company, you know, they have to make sure that they are obtaining that insurance through them. This bill also states that a city or town may deny an issuance of a permit or a license for a rental property for those reasons. Failure to pay the fee um, or the, the permit fee or the license fee um, at the time of the application, if the owner has a, a suspended permit or license for the same vacation or short-term rental it can be denied. Um, maybe the applicant provides false information, another reason for a denial. Um, or if the owner is a registered sex offender or has been convicted of any serious felony in the last five years, um, which is just kind of a random thing to include. It kind of surprised me, but anyways, it's just something that they added in there that the permit can be denied in the, for that reason. Um, a city or town that requires a local regulatory permit or license must adopt an ordinance to allow the city or town to initiate um, an administrative process to suspend a permit or license for a period of up to 12 months if there are three minor or one significant verified violation. And so really interesting how these laws are kind of expanding. Short-term rentals are here to stay. 
Okay, the the only way that associations are going to be able to regulate short term rentals is through CCNR amendments. Um, there are these added protections that we're seeing the state putting into place now, where the cities are getting involved and requiring permits and notification to owners and allowing an administrative process now. Um, but again, it's going to take a little while for these cities to get up to speed on this and start implementing these programs. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see what happens with this new law as, as the effective date for all of these laws is going to be September 24th, 2022. So starting that date, all five of these laws will go into effect. And we'll continue to update you on any developments on these new laws. And I'm sure there'll be questions as things are being implemented in your associations. And we'll be continue to talk about this throughout the rest of this year, 2022, and address issues that may come up, the questions that may come up as we navigate all of these new laws. We're going to be issuing a, um, a cheat sheet on a summary of all of these new laws, um, and that will be out in the very near future. So stay tuned. Uh, keep an eye out for that. But you'll be able to share that electronically with your boards and your homeowners if you so choose. Okay, let's switch to our next hot topic. Um, our first hot topic was pretty long, um, talking about new legislation, um, but it was a big legislative year, so it's important that we talked about those. Um, we also had a very large judicial year in Arizona. So um, the second hot topic we're going to talk about is new judicial rent restrictions on amendments to CCNRs. Um, as some of you may know, uh, there was a Supreme Court case in Arizona um, called Callaway versus Calabria that was issued by the Supreme Court of Arizona on March 22nd, 2022. And I think anybody in our industry will agree that this is kind of an unusual case for associations. It has a negative impact on associations. Um, and so I want to just kind of give you some quick facts on it. Um, you know, the bottom line is the Arizona Supreme Court is making it more difficult for associations to uh, pass and implement CCNR amendments. We think there are some pivots that associations can do um, to best manage this new case. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the facts of the case quickly. Okay, so um, we're going to be sharing a copy of the case in our um, on the Zoom and on Facebook Live here with you today in case you want to read it yourself. So in 2015, um, Calabria Ranch, which is the association in this litigation, was formed and it was divided into five lots. Um, and two of these lots were owned by Calway, um, who is the plaintiff in this case. So there's only five lots in this association. This is a very small association. And two out of the five are owned by the plaintiff, Calway. In January of 2018, the other owners of the remaining lots, so the other three owners, amended CCNRs without Callaway's approval or knowledge. And Callaway uh, was very upset about this and claimed that the amendments negatively affected him and his lot, which was almost 23 acres. Um, and the other owner's lots, just for comparison purposes, were between 3.3 to 6.6 .6 acres. So he has very large lots. He owns two-fifths of, of the land in the association. He wasn't even consulted on the amendment. Um, and you know, just kind of like as a baseline on this, I think the court really didn't like that. Um, I think that the court was upset that um, the association passed an amendment to the CCNRs without consulting and allowing all owners to vote on it. Um, I think that's kind of the backbone of why they made this decision. Um, and so basically what the court, the court looked at the facts and a couple of things that came out of this case were A, they, the court was unhappy that the amendment was passed without Callaway even knowing about it or having a chance to vote yes or no on it. And the language that the three-fifths of the owners in the association approved as an amendment um, the court didn't like the language. And basically, the first thing that the court said in this case is Arizona courts can blue pencil um, CCNRs to eliminate language that is grammatically severable or has unreasonable provisions. Um, and basically, what this means is the court's now telling us that Arizona courts can strike language from amended CCNRs where the court determines that the amendment is invalid. The Supreme Court also went on to state 
that the original declaration must give sufficient notice of the possibility of a future amendment. That is, amendments must be reasonable and foreseeable. And so in this case, Arizona Courts and Associations considering amendments to a declaration must look to the original declaration to determine did the original declaration give sufficient notice to the members of a future amendment. Um, in most cases, I would say, yes, you look at the amendment provision in the CCNR, it's usually towards the end of the document. But the court even went on further to say that this notice provision in the original declaration must alert the owner to the fact that the CCNRs can be amended to refine them, correct the error, fill in the gap, or change it in a particular way. Now, I guess to those of us who are industry insiders and have been practicing law in this area for a long time, I don't think I've ever seen a set of CCNRs in 27 years that has that exact language that says these CCNRs can be amended to refine them, correct an error, fill in a gap, or change it in a particular way. Um, it's just not language that we typically see. Um, so I guess the bottom line on this case is it's perplexing. It's some people in the industry are saying, don't do any amendments to CCNRs right now, based on the Callaway case, because the court is really cracking down on amendments and they can blue pencils of anything that you do. That's not the approach that our firm is taking. Our advice is don't overreact, don't overcorrect. We still are doing CCNR amendments. We're still helping associations with CCNR amendments, but we are being very careful in how we are drafting the amendment provisions. We are including language in the amendments that um, mirrors the language that the um, Supreme Court of Arizona are adjusting, talking about possibility of the amendment being refined, correcting an error, filling in a gap, changing it in a particular way. We are reacting to the ruling in a positive way. So we're taking what the court is telling us. We're doing our best to notify our clients of the risks that there may be if they do do amendments. And we're wording the amendments in such a way that the owners aren't going to be opposed to them. And we're filling in in the amendments language that the Supreme Court is suggesting. Um, and so, yes, we are being more cautious and careful as we're drafting the amendments, but there is a workaround on this. And so if your association is in, in a situation where you're deciding we haven't had our documents amended for like the past 10 years, you really should be updating your documents 10 years at least to get them consistent with the changes that have been taking place under Arizona law and delete, you know, old, outdated language, et cetera. Um, and if you're one of those associations, you may want to check out our cheat sheet. We have a great cheat sheet. For those of you who are familiar with our firm, we have over 60 cheat sheets on different topics pertaining to associations. And one of our most popular ones is amending association documents and implementing rental restrictions. And so that would be something that I would definitely suggest that you take a look at. And we're going to be sharing that with you on Zoom and Facebook Live. Okay, let's switch over and talk about another hot topic, which is rental properties. Our firm's cheat sheet, um, we have a cheat sheet on rental properties, which we have been fine tuning over the years. Um, we're going to be updating that as well um, based upon the new legislation that's going to go into effect in September. Basically, I think we all can agree that there has been a large increase in Arizona in the number of short-term and long-term rentals in Arizona. So I think it's a really helpful thing to do to talk a little bit about what exactly is a short-term rental and what is considered a long-term rental? Because I understand from hearing feedback from my team, thank you, Mulcahy team, um, that some people are asking questions for what is a short-term rental? A short-term rental is going to be something that it could be less than 30 days. It could be 30 days or more. It could be 60 days. I mean, it really can be defined by your association's CCNRs. Typically, you know, we will see a short-term rental defined as less than 30 or less than 60 days. A longer-term rental is going to be typically like a year lease or a two-year lease. It's important to remember a few things. If you are having issues with short-term rentals or just rentals in general in your association, the owner is responsible for 
making sure they are complying with the association's documents, right? And any of their guests or tenants must also comply with the association's documents. If the guest or tenant doesn't comply with the association's documents, who's responsible? The owner. Um, And we're going to talk a little bit in a minute about how do we handle bad rentals or bad renters? Um, and what's the best way to, to get the owner landlord to either evict the renter or to get the renter to behave and follow the association's rules? Okay, let's talk a little bit about the right of an owner to rent their property. So if we look at both the Planned Communities Act and the Condominium Act, owners have a right to rent their properties in a planned community or a condominium unless rentals are prohibited or otherwise regulated via the CCNRs. Basically, the the bottom line um, of Arizona law is that unless the CCNRs have some sort of a restriction or a prohibition on rentals, whether they're short-term or long-term, owners are allowed to rent. Um, If your documents are silent on renters, that means that owners are allowed to rent. Associations can have rental time restrictions in their CCNRs. So maybe you're one of those associations that has a provision that says owners can lease their property for a minimum of 30 days, a minimum of 60 days, or a minimum of a year. That is totally legit Um, under the law. It just needs to be in your CCNRs. If you have a renter in your association, what is the type of information that the association can ask for from the landlord regarding the renter? And this is just consistent with Arizona law. Um, Arizona law dictates the specific things that we can ask the landlord for with regard to the tenant. So we can only ask for very few things. I'm sure this is going to upset some of you hearing this. Maybe you think that we can get more information, but the law is very strict on what we can require. Um, So we can ask for the name and contact information for any adults um, occupying the unit or the lot. We can ask for the time period of the lease, including the beginning and ending dates of the tenancy. And we can ask for a description and the license plate numbers of the tenant's vehicles. Um, If you're an age-restricted community, like a 55 and over community, we can ask also for a government-issued identification with a photograph of the tenant and confirmation that the tenant meets the association's minimum age requirements in your 55 and over community. So really, there's only four things we can ask for. We can, you know, just the name and contact information of the adults occupying the unit or lot, how long the lease is, and a description and the license plate numbers of the tenant's vehicles, and then 55 and over verification if you are a 55 and over community. Um, So what are some things that I typically see mistakes on by associations on this? Often associations want a copy of the lease. Often associations want a copy of the credit report of the tenant. Neither of those things the association can require. And that's regardless, even if your association's documents say that the association can, you know, get a copy of the lease or more detailed information, you know, that's not covered under this law, you can't do it. Some things that you want to think about is there are some fees that the association can charge, and these can be charged for short-term rentals. So even if you have like a nightly rental or a monthly rental of a property in your association, or if it's, you know, a, a yearly rental, a longer term lease, there are some fees that the association can charge. So it's important that you're aware of these. And again, if it's a nightly rental, you can charge this fee for each nightly rental. Obviously, if it's, you know, a tenant's coming in and and doing like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday thing, you know, it's one lease and you be able to charge these fees once for the same tenant. In providing the information about the tenant, so when they give those three or four categories of information that they're required to give the association, we just talked about, the association can charge the owner a fee of no more than $25 um, for that information. And that can be charged for each new tenant, but it cannot be charged if the same tenants renew an existing lease. So if somebody has a one-year lease and you charge the $25 to get the you know contact information for the adults occupying the property, how long the lease is, and the description of the license plates and the vehicle identification, um, for the tenants' vehicles, you can only charge that $25 fee once for that one year. If they renew their lease, you can't charge that again. There is a $15 late fee if the owner doesn't provide this information regarding their tenant. 
and it has to be provided within 15 days it's after a postmarked request from the association. Um, if they don't provide it, then, then you can charge the $15 late fee. So remember that oftentimes associations are hearing questions from our clients like saying the, the owner doesn't provide us, they don't tell us when there's a short-term rental, they don't provide us with any information, and sometimes boards are jumping to, we want to levy a large fine. Um, and, you know, under the statute, you, you can't do that. Basically, the statute limits us to charging the $25 um, for, you know, processing this, this, this information and then a $15 late fee. If you request this information regarding the tenant, the categories of information that we can have and the owner doesn't comply, then we can charge a $15 late fee. Some things that we, you know, also cannot ask for would be um, the tenant's rental application. Like sometimes um, associations will say, you know, hey, we want to see the rental application that the tenant might um, filled out to rent the property. The association is not allowed to, to do that. We're also not allowed to get any other personal information regarding the tenant, like the tenant's job, or if the tenant has any other private personal information that's not covered under the three categories of information that we can ask them for. Some other kind of interesting areas or aspects of Arizona law and rental properties um, and HOAs and condos that I'd like to just kind of close out this topic on is the association cannot prohibit or otherwise restrict a member from serving on the board based upon the member not being an occupant of the property. So if you're an off-site owner and maybe you're leasing your property, the board can't say that you can't be on the board or that you can't run the board. Um, so even if your documents say you have to live on the property, this law trumps it. This kind of opens the door for owner landlords who aren't physically living on the property to still serve on the board. Um, another kind of weird part of this law is that an owner may use a crime-free addendum as part of a lease agreement. And this is the owner, right? The owner has the right to use a crime-free addendum, but this section does not prohibit the owner's use of a crime-free addendum. We have a great blog on this topic if you're more interested in that, um, and we're going to be sharing that with you on Zoom and Facebook Live. The bottom line on the crime-free addendum is, of course, you want to be renting if you're an owner to good tenants and, and making sure that there's no legal activity going to be happening on the property, etc. Um, another interesting part of this law on rental properties is an association that may lawfully enforce a provision in the community association documents um, that restricts the residency of persons who are required to be registered as a class two or three sex offender. Um, and so what this means, and this was just kind of a weird throw-in that they put in back in about five or six years ago. Um, and basically it's, it's saying that if you want to implement a provision in your CCNRs, you want to pass a provision in your CCNRs to say that, hey, no level two or three sex offenders can live in our association. Um, this provision appears to be giving the green light to do that. Now, as somebody who practices in this area for many years, I can tell you that I have only seen one or two associations in Arizona, and, and mind you, there's 10,000 associations in Arizona that have implemented a no level two or three sex offenders allowed to occupy a unit or a lot in an association. It's a little bit problematic because I think there's some constitutional challenges here um, that could be raised and that could cause the association to incur a lot of legal fees fighting it. So if you're thinking about doing that, um, you definitely want to get some legal advice and understand the risks um, that somebody who is aggrieved by that type of a provision you know, might take this type of a case to the Supreme Court of the United States. The last thing um, that's really kind of an interesting part, I like this part of this law, is that an owner of a rental property is required to abate or stop criminal activity on their property. Um, and if they don't, the owner can be held only liable for the behavior of their tenant. Um, and I've seen only one case over the past decade where this particular provision came into play. We had a bad landlord, um, actually like a slumlord, and uh, there were all types, all kinds of police activity on many of the properties that this landlord um, managed. 
And ultimately, there was a drive-by shooting in, in a particular association where the, the landlord was leasing to a drug house, basically. And the landlord was held um, criminally liable. And he was prosecuted by the county prosecutor's office for basically running these slum houses. And so that is something to keep in our back pocket if we ever um, have a really bad tenant that has criminal activity that is going on in their property. We do have some legal remedies. We need to document it by going to the police. We need to you know, go to the prosecutor's office to see if it's the type of case that they'll be prosecuting. Um, but it gives us some options if you have a really bad tenant um, that is violating the law. I think we've kind of covered everything on that particular topic. Um, well, a couple more things just to close out. Remember that landlords must register their rental properties. Starting in September, September 24th, there's going to be some special registration permit type things. Um, but they also have to register, you know, previously they had to register with the county. Previously, you know, there's an Arizona revised statute 33 1902 that stated that an owner of a residential property located in Arizona is required to file a notification form with the county where the residential property is located. And the notification form had to indicate the property owner's name, the address of the property owner, the telephone number street address of the residential property and the year the property was built. Um, why was this being done? So that the anytime that there is a short-term rental or a long-term rental, that um, the taxes are paid on that transaction. Um, and owners who don't comply with this requirement um, after notification and 10-day grace period are subject to a civil penalty of $1,000 plus $100 per month. For every month, the owner is not in compliance with this notification requirement. Um, and so really, I think kind of the bottom line on these short-term rentals is that they're clamping down on it, right? So you, you always had to register with the county, but now you're going to have to get a permit with the city or town that the rental property is located in. And you're going to have to get emergency contact information and you're going to have to notify the the neighbors. And so and these are all steps by our legislature to try to better balance the rental, whether it's a short-term or a long-term rental, um, balance the needs of the owner to rent their property versus protect the neighbors and the city or town from any poor behavior by the tenants. So I think this is definitely a step in the right direction. I hope that this will be implemented quickly by the cities and towns. I hope that there will be consequences for landlord owners that don't get the permits. And remember, you can always snitch. So if your association has a, a bad landlord owner that is renting and not complying with this, you can contact the county and you can contact the city or town that the property is located in and ask them to investigate the investor. And I'm confident that based upon these new laws, they will. If you have any problems with rental properties in your community, you may want to consider an amendment to your CCNRs, um, maybe to implement longer time periods, minimum time rental periods. So maybe if you have no minimum rental periods right now, you may want to consider implementing by a CCNR amendment to have a minimum of 30, 60, or 90 day rentals. You may want to consider, you still have the right to fine um, the owner for violations of the CCNRs by the tenant. So again, going back to, we can only charge that $25 fee for the ten each tenancy or each new lease, as long as it's not a renewal. Um, and then the $15 late fee, if they don't give us the information within 15 days of making the request for the information, but we still can fine for bringing glass into the pool or with the tenant's dog, not picking up after the tenant's dog or loud parties, we still have the right to find for that behavior and we find the owner for that behavior. And what I found over the years, many years of, of handling bad tenant issues is the best way to get the landlord owner to comply is to hold them accountable and find them for the behavior of the tenant, pursue our legal remedies, which may include going to superior court, getting an injunction, um, compelling the landlord to make their tenant comply with the association's documents. The best thing to do if you have a landlord that is leasing to a tenant is to have your attorney pick up the phone, 
call the landlord owner and just tell them straight up, this is what's happening, provide evidence, um, tell the landlord owner, this is how much it's going to cost. You know, we're going to fine you, we're going to go to court and we're going to get an injunction against you. And, you know, you're looking at 10, 15, $20,000 in legal fees, you know, and maybe five, $10,000 in fines for all this bad behavior. And in my experience, what happens with the landlord is this is a business to them, right? And once you explain to them how much this tenant is costing them, what do they want to do? They're going to evict the tenant because this is a hot housing market right now. There's lots of people that are looking for good housing. And if they've got somebody that's costing them money and, you know, cutting into their profits, they're going to want that person out. So I think that's a really effective strategy if you have a bad tenant in your association. Having the attorney reach out to the landlord in a very firm phone call, explaining here are the consequences financial for you and um, litigation, and this is how much it's going to cost you. And you know, I can tell you with 100 percent of the time when we've done that, the landlord evicts the tenant. Um, Okay, so I think we've covered uh, as much as we need to on rentals. Uh, We spent a lot of time on it, but it is the number one issue in our office. Let's switch gears and talk a little bit about water rights. Just something to keep an eye on for your association. The Arizona Department of Water Resources has declared a goal of sustainable water supplies by the year 2030. And what this means for associations is that there are going to be some water reductions for associations in the coming years. And there's management plans that have been created by the Arizona Department of Water Resources. And basically, they're designed to hold um, the state accountable for water usage. And there's a total of five plans to be enacted over five decades. So it started in 1980 and it's going all the way to 2030. Currently, Arizona is now in the third management plan. And this plan is going to affect HOAs, which maybe have more than 10 acres of turf. So that might be some of the people here on this call today. And there are certain water allotments for those communities. Um, and, you know, as it stands for the third management phase, um, the allotment is compatible with plant, turf, and tree water needs right now. However, tighter water restrictions are ahead and they're coming up quickly. The fourth management plan is going to start in January of 2023. And this transition is definitely going to promise smaller water reductions for communities with 10 or more acres of turf. Um, And, you know, it's something that associations that have this 10 or more acres of turf, it's going to start to affect you. Um, So if your city, town, or municipality is offering any sort of um, free classes on water reduction, if you're one of these associations that has 10 or more acres of turf, you should be dialing into that. And we'll be sharing information on that if we see any of these types of classes come about. Um, as we go into that uh, fourth management plan. But the biggest water restrictions are coming in the fifth management plan, and that is set to commence in 2025 or 2026. And this plan is going to reduce water allotments for turf to 4.77 acre per feet per acre. Um, And so these are going to be smaller communities with smaller amounts of common area turf areas are going to start to be affected by this in 2025 and 2026. So we added this as a hot topic because this is something you need to keep an eye on for the future. If your association has a large amount of common areas and you are currently watering them, um, there is going to be some specific things that you're going to have to do to adjust to some of the new requirements by the state of Arizona. And so we have some information that we're going to be sharing with you. There's some differences between the fourth and fifth management plan. We also have the FOHAP management plan um, for water allotments. And we hope that you'll keep this on your radar um, because starting January 2023, some of these associations that have a large amount of turf, 10 acres, these are going to come into play and affect your association. And then in 25 or 26, 2025 or 26, most other associations are going to have these water allotments coming into play. So what are some things that associations can do in response to these new requirements for less water usage in your associations? Think about reducing 
water hungry turf to reduce overall water consumption, maybe start converting some areas into desert landscaping. And I know that the grant process for many different cities, towns, and municipalities just started up again because most of these cities, towns, and municipalities have a fiscal year that ended June 30th. And so how these grants work is you file an application for a grant and your grant would be to convert turf to desert landscaping. In some cases, the cities, towns, and municipalities will pay 50% of the cost to do that, depending on what their formulas are and how much money they have. So that would be a great way to partner with the cities or towns or municipalities that you live in and get a grant from them to help you conserve water in your association so that you can be ready for when the fourth and fifth management plan on water reductions comes into play. Um, another thing to do would be start talking with your residents about water challenges coming up in the future and encouraging people to adopt and establish their own water consumption plans so that they're using less water, but also start the dialogue about the association may have to change how we've always done things. If you have a lot of turf, you may need to change the turf to something else or um, maybe you're not every year doing winter lawn. I mean, there's lots of different things that associations are doing. And begin thinking about ways to reduce water use as an association. That should be on your long-range plan for your association, whether it's transitioning to desert um, landscaping or maybe using um, desert-adapted vegetation. All of these things are things that can help you um, minimize your water usage to comply with some of these new requirements. Um, for more information on water rights for your association, you certainly can visit the Arizona Department of Water Resources at https new.hazywater.org. Okay, let's switch gears and talk a little bit about inflation. Our last two topics here are kind of go hand in hand with the economy. As you probably saw recently, we, the inflation numbers just came out, I think, on July 12th, and we're at like over 9%, just barely over 9% inflation rate. What does this mean for associations? This means that you're paying higher salaries if you have any direct employees because there's a labor shortage. Gas prices are higher. Cost of goods for your association is higher. It's difficult to find labor. Um, it's difficult to get projects completed. Projects that maybe you bid two years ago, maybe it was 100000 Guess what? Now it's 200000 because the cost of materials has gone up and the cost of labor has gone up. Or maybe you know, you've know got the problem where you've got a small project. You can't even get a contractor to come in and bid on it. Our kind of our old rule of thumb was, okay, we whenever we have a project, we try to get two or three bids. Well, now we're hearing, and I even see this in my association, we... We can't get three bids. We can't even get two people to come out and hold the property to give us a bid. Um, and so these are all problems, sign of the times, right? The economy is, is out of control right now in terms of inflation. And there are problems. And so what are some things that associations should be doing if you're facing some of these issues where, you know, hey, we budgeted this amount of money and we can't meet our expenses. And you need to be budgeting adequately based upon these increases that we're seeing. And that is ultimately going to result in a higher assessment rate, or maybe you may have to levy a special assessment. And starting the communication and the dialogue with the owners about the need and why the assessment rate is going to have to go up um, is a very important thing to be doing. Um, if you're in a situation right now or at the halfway point, a little bit past the halfway point for 2022, and you don't have enough money to make it through the year, you may have to think about not doing some things this year that you planned on doing, um, cutting back. Of course, that's going to lead to deferred maintenance, which may cost more. You may need to do a special assessment and make sure you're following what your CCNR say about how to do a special assessment. You may have to increase your regular assessment to meet the expenses, the additional expenses caused by inflation, and make sure you're following your CCNRs and getting advice from your attorney on what is the best way to increase our assessment in compliance with our association's documents. Um, so just kind of a hot topic right now is inflation and the economy and how this is affecting associations if we can't get projects done. 
There may be times where we can't get the rebids. I think when you're presenting the bid at a meeting, you are going to have to say, listen, these are all the vendors we contacted to get a bid. We only heard back from two. One decided to take a pass on it. So we have one bid and we're going to have to stop making that three bid hard and fast rule for everything if it's just not possible. Now, obviously, any projects that are over a certain dollar amount, whether it's 100000 or 50000 depending on how large your association is, you, you really need to have at least two bids for large projects. But um, we need to adjust our thinking a little bit. Um, we also need to be very carefully looking at the financials and the budget, the year-to-date budget. Are we over budget? Are we under budget? What adjustments do we need to make? I'm really opposed to deferred maintenance because it just creates a pipeline of problems in the future. So, you know, if if, if they to like push off like our association, we need to resurface the tennis court. Um, as a tennis player, I didn't really want to do that because the court is kind of, they really do need, you know, some maintenance. But it's just something that we had to push off to next year because it wasn't a health and safety issue and we just don't have the money this year to do it. So um, sometimes you're going to have to make some difficult and tough decisions like that. Um, Another hot topic just to kind of round out today is we're starting to see a spike in owners not paying assessments. And this probably goes hand in hand with the increasing costs of everything else that we're seeing, whether it's gas, groceries, clothing, all these prices are going up. And so a couple important things to just talk about as we start to see increases in the number of owners that aren't paying assessments. We haven't seen this, right? Throughout the entire pandemic, what we saw was owners paying at record rates. We had a number of discussions as a firm When is the shoe going to drop? In 2020, 2021, are owners going to not be able to pay their assessments because of the pandemic? What we found was with the amount of money that the government was pumping into our economy and with the number of different things that owners were able to take advantage of, disposable money at their fingertips, and they were paying their assessments. Now, kind of that money train has stopped and we're starting to see spikes in delinquencies. So, What can your association do if you're starting to see owners not pay their assessments? Number one, look at the list of delinquents every single month. Um, Maybe you had that on autopilot in 2020, 2021, no more. Every month, you need to be looking at the owners paying their assessments. You need to be sending out courtesy reminder letters. You need to be meaning the property once it hits a threshold. Maybe it's 60 days past due. Maybe it's 90 days past due. It just depends on what your policy is for your association. And you need to be getting it to your association's attorney to take the next step in a prompt manner. Maybe it doesn't go to the attorney until $750 is owed or a thousand is owed or whatever. But the faster we get the file in terms of if I get it at 750 or a thousand, it's easier for me to collect the debt. If you give me the file when the owner owes $12,000, it's going to be harder to collect the money when it's that high. Um, then we get into the danger that the owner might be filing bankruptcy or something like that. So just some tips from the trenches. What's the best way to collect money from delinquent owners? A couple of thoughts. When a file is turned over to our firm, we do a 360 credit evaluation of the owner and then we report back to you. Okay, so let's say the owner's name is Johnny Appleseed. We have a whole checklist of a number of different places that we look to determine Johnny Appleseed's credit. Um, is there a trustee sale on the property? Is the Johnny Appleseed paying his or her deed of trust or mortgage? Has he filed bankruptcy? Is this person employed? We verify the appointment. Are they still employed there? Look at their social media accounts. Are they on a trip to Hawaii? Well, apparently they've got money to go to Hawaii, but they're not paying their dues. You know, we are checking LinkedIn to confirm employment. We are looking at, are they delinquent in the payment of their credit card bills? Are there any other judgments against them? Is anybody else searching their credit in addition to us? Maybe that means that there's not a judgment against them yet, but they owe other people money. These are all things that we look at, and then we report back to you. We put it in easy to read format, and we give you our recommendations on how to collect the debt. So really, that's the first thing we do when an association turns over a file to our firm. 
to collect delinquent assessments from an owner, we do this credit evaluation and then we determine, okay, does this person have money? Are they employed? Are they upside down on their mortgage or deed of trust? What's the value of the property? And we, you know, provide that information to you with a recommendation as to how to proceed. And typically we start out by sending a demand letter, a very firm demand letter, threatening either foreclosure or getting a personal judgment against them in justice court. Um, there are pros and cons to both legal remedies. So if we're going to foreclose on a property, we are only going to do that if either the owner is going to bring us because paid the association, the amount that's due, plus the attorney's fees that have been incurred. Um, they're going to pay us if they don't want to lose their property. And if there's significant equity in the property, which right now there should be because the appreciation of the value of the properties has just gone hoopy the past three years, they're not going to let their property go away. So get taken away at a foreclosure. Basically, you know, if the property is worth $250,000, 250000 and they maybe have a $100,000 mortgage or deed of trust on the property, that means there's $150,000 in equity. They're not going to walk away from that. So that's a good choice to file a foreclosure against them because they're going to pay. They're not going to let that property go away. And if they don't pay, somebody else will buy it at the sheriff's sale after we get the foreclosure judgment and somebody else will pay us in full, meaning the association in full, the amount that is due. Um, so that's a, a good risk to file a foreclosure against somebody that has, you know, significant equity in their property. In some cases, we'll go to justice court, get a justice court judgment against the owner. If they are employed, we can garnish their wages or their bank account, um, you know, and it's sometimes a little bit harder to collect on that because um, we have to have the money in the bank account. There's a little kind of more uncertainty with that, with the foreclosure. At this time in this economy, that's probably the route that we're going right now. And it's funny because things change. Back in 2008, we weren't doing a lot of foreclosures because there wasn't a lot of equity in properties. So you have to be working with a law firm that is really in tune with what's going on in our economy, what's going on with property values versus the amount of loans on the property and thinking, thinking about how can I punch in the code to get this owner to pay? Um, because that's our job just to get the owner to pay and to make the association full. And then again, in terms of how much is owed, and make sure that the owner doesn't do it again and get behind from every six months and not paying. We want to make sure that we send a message that this is how this is going to be handled if you don't pay assessments. And there's a process, it's quick. And if you don't pay, you're going to be, you know, in the hands of the attorney and the attorney is going to be taking legal actions against you. Um, so that's our recommendation. Just get on top of those delinquent owners. If you're seeing a spike in delinquencies in your association, get those liens filed. Get it to the attorney for the association as quickly as possible. Um, because the faster that we get the file, the easier it is for us to collect the debt. We are coming to the very close to the end of our hot topics. And we're, we're in the season right now where we are seeing the primary national elections and some of the state elections are going to be held in November. So let's, it's a good time just to do a little primary refresher. Signs can go up 71 days before the primary. It can be taken down later than 15 days after the date of the general election. So we're right in this time period right now, right in you know, this primary time period to all the way to the general election in November. So it's going to be 15 days after the general election. They will have to have those signs down. Um, so just so you know that that is, um, we have to allow it. Um, some things to think about are that the flags, we're starting to see political signs as flags, right? And our firm's opinion is that a flag can be treated like a political sign. Um, you know, if, if somebody wants to fly their flag, that's fine for political activity. Um, and I, it's my opinion that I will allow them to fly their flag, but the flag can't be offensive to somebody else, like a Confederate flag or something like that. Um, the flag can't contain, cannot contain obscenity or abusive language or anything like that. Um, and so that would be the type of thing that the association would be able to um, require them to take that type of a 
political flag down. You're going to see political signs, political flags, and we're here to help you if you have any questions on anything unusual that may come up. Um, last but not least, I'm going to mention this electric vehicles and charging stations. This mainly is, I mean, I guess I, I suppose it could come into play in planned communities too, but this mainly is going to be a condo issue. You're going to start seeing owners in your associations wanting the association to provide an electrical charging station. Um, and as you may know, President Biden in August of 2021 signed an executive order that's going to push automakers to have 50% of all vehicles sold come equipped with a plug-in hybrid battery electric or fuel cell powertrain by 2030. So electric cars are 50% of the production by 2030 is going to be electric cars. And so you kind of have to have a plan as an association. This should be on your long-range plan. Um, if you're a condo, sometimes planned communities are providing electric charging stations as well, although mostly in the planned community, the owners have it on their property and they, they're providing it for themselves. In a condo, it's a little differently because the car is typically parked in a limited common element and there won't be any place to you know, put in their own charging station, although we have seen it in some condos where, um, you know, the owner is supplying their own charging station at their own cost, and it's not something that the association is paying for. Something to think about, there may be a way to pass through the cost to your owners, like having a swipe, a credit card swipe, they have to pay for it the cost. You may have to convert a common area parking space to be used just for this, and there are some legal issues that may come up with that. We may see some laws with the Arizona legislature in the future. We haven't seen anything yet that talks about responsibilities of the association to do something like this, but that, just keep that on your radar. If you're a condo, you should be thinking about what is our solution on this? You know, if an owner wants an electrical vehicle charging station, how can you work with them so that they put it, you know, in the area where their vehicle is and that they pay the cost? Or if the association is going to provide it, you know, how are we going to make it fair? How are we going to charge the owners that are using it, pass through the cost to them? And so we have some more information on that. If, if you're interested in or you need help through that process, please reach out to our firm and, and we can provide you with some other things that we've done for other clients on this issue. Last but not least, sorry, this has been kind of a long class, but there's so many good hot topics that it's hard for me to narrow them down. The last one is online voting. We're seeing an increase in associations um, using online voting to vote for directors, elections, removal of board members, special assessments, increase in regular assessments, annual meetings. Um, and so electronic voting is permissible under Arizona law. If your association is going through that process and you want to convert it to totally electrical, electronic voting, make sure that you're reaching out to our firm, make sure that you're using a company that is reputable, that because the third party is going to be handling typically the entire election, you want to make sure that um, they understand associations, that they've done elections like this in the past, and that they're aware of the special requirements under Arizona law, et cetera. But just a thought um, for the future, I think this is definitely something that associations are going to be doing more and more in the future in getting away from, you know, returning a paper ballot to now we're doing everybody's voting electronically on their computer. Okay, so we covered a lot of hot topics today. Um, we, we talked for about an hour and 23 minutes. Sorry, I went a little bit over. Um, we're going to convert over now and do our question and answer period, which for those of you who may be tuning in for the first time, at the end of every presentation that we do, we do a question and answer. Okay, so it looks like we have about 27 questions. The first question is from a board member. If we establish a website with a section of information for all HOA owners and one for board members only, what is our responsibility to residents who do not own or have access to computers? Really good question. So, I mean, tough call. I'm sure that the percentage of people who do not have access to computers in associations is, is probably pretty small. Um, you know, all libraries have a computer that, that people you know, can use, public libraries. Um, what I would recommend is most associations just, you know, have a website and most start putting information on there to make things easier and to be more at the fingertips as a resident. So um, I would definitely continue forward with doing that. If you have somebody who doesn't have 
a computer and who wants information, just ask them to make a records request. And then we have 10 business days to respond. Next question. We have a member in our HOA who does not like to follow the rules. He has made numerous complaints. And at the last annual meeting on July 14th, he stood up to say he was taking his complaints to his attorney. At this point, should the board stop talking to him and wait until we are contacted by his attorney and let our attorney handle the situation? You know, this is a tough call. I don't know kind of what the issues are that you're having with this owner, but, um, you know, it's, it's escalating. Let's put it like that. So I probably, if I were you, what I would advise you to do is get your attorney involved for the association and um, maybe have the attorney write him a letter the owner a letter and ask for the owner's attorney's name. So call his bluff and maybe try to get the two attorneys to discuss the issues and and maybe it can be resolved. I mean, of course, you can always sit back and wait, but that's not going to solve the problem of this owner not following the rules. And obviously, this owner is agitated and upset. He's making some complaints. I think probably it's now time to escalate this to the attorney. Question three, our community manager tells us that unless he witnesses the violation, he cannot do anything about it. I witness violations as an owner. Is there a statute that outlines who can report violations and must the reporter's name be revealed to a violator? It really just depends on what the violation is. A good rule of thumb is that the manager should go out and verify the violation to make sure it's a violation, right? Um, because the manager is hired, that's their job, that's what they should be doing. But there are some violations that the manager isn't able to verify, like um, parking violations on the street, or maybe a dog barking at two in the morning, or you know something like that, that they're not present on the property 24-7, 365. And in those cases, I think that the owner should provide documentary evidence, whether it's a photo or a video, and that should be sufficient for the association to take action after reviewing it. Um, so first part of it, you know, as long as you're documenting it, and there's evidence that should be sufficient to provide to the board and then have the board can determine if it's a violation and they're going to take action. There's a statute that talks about, it's an Arizona statute, it applies to condos and planned communities, and it talks about um, the fact that whoever complains about the violation, that is something that goes into the association's records. And if an owner requests to see the name of the person who is, you know, objecting, or complaining about a violation and it's in the association's records, we would have to provide that to the owner. Um, also, there's a kind of a, a weird statute in Arizona that says that if an owner sends back a certified letter in response to a violation letter from the association, that we have to respond with certain categories of information to the owner regarding the violation. And one of the categories of information is who was the person that witnessed the violation. So you may have to have your name disclosed based on that too. Okay, next question from an owner who used to be a board member, one of my favorite people, a fellow Wisconsinite. Um, Great to see you here today. Recognizing that governing documents may be modernized, amended, or restated. It is my understanding that once approved by the membership, these adopted changes are required to be recorded at the Maricopa County Recorder's Office within 30 days in order to be valid and enforceable. We are a planned community and what ARS rule is applicable to our situation? Okay, so there is a statute that says that any amendments to CCNRs in a planned community or a condominium need to be recorded within 30 days of obtaining the last approval um, to get you over the threshold to having the CCNR amendment pass. And it's, it's in the Planned Communities Act. The next question is from a board member. If a homeowner requests a change to the exterior of his home, and the board does not respond to the request, is there a timeline wherein the homeowner can proceed without board approval under Arizona law? So no, there is no statute or case law that allows us to do this. Um, And so if a homeowner asks for a change to their property and the board doesn't respond, um, I would first look to do the CCNRs say anything about this? Because sometimes the CCNRs say that if the board doesn't act on an application, 
um, the application is approved after a certain number of days. But there is no state law that says this. And you know, most association documents do not have that. If the board fails to act, means it's approved after certain days. So um, bottom line is there's no Arizona law that says that the association has to respond um, in a certain period of time. That being said, please, as boards and architectural committees, respond in a timely manner on architectural applications. And please do not forget that if somebody submits an incomplete application, deny the application and ask them to submit a new completed application with the, all the required information. Okay, next question. Can the board use the executive session for planning to be better prepared for the general board meeting? So short answer would be no. You know, the executive session can only be used to discuss executive session topics, which would be like advice from your attorney, um, any pending or contemplated litigation, discussion of personal health or financial information about an owner, um, discussion of complaints or compensation of your vendors or your employees. It's not meant to be like a planning time away from the homeowners to plan for the general board meeting. Um, what you may want to do is have a, a couple of solutions, workarounds, loopholes would be less than a quorum could meet to discuss planning for a general board meeting and do some planning, but it has to be less than a quorum. Or you could just have a planning session board meeting and you have to notice it and you plan for the general board meeting. A lot of associations um, that have, you know, a larger association, sometimes they'll do that. They call it a workshop, but it has to still be necessary and in compliance with the Arizona Open Meeting Law. Okay, next question, um, which is number seven. Who owns painting and repair for walls facing green belts of another HOA? Our CCNRs do not define. It really depends on where the wall is placed. So if it's on the property line, typically the association will maintain the side that's on their side of the property line and then the other HOA is going to maintain it on the other side that's half on their property, the wall is half on their property. Um, it really, these are tricky issues because sometimes you have to have a survey done to determine if the wall, you know, is where the wall is located, whose property is on. But 90% of the time, I would say that each respective side takes care of the other side. Okay. Can an HOA prohibit campaigning for HOA board offices? So really, no, I don't think that we can. I mean, if somebody wants to campaign by sending out a letter to the community or, you know, having a, a meeting, like we said, we're going to have these informal meetings now in the association common areas starting in September of 2022 under the new law. Um, I don't think you can prohibit it. One thing that is kind of problematic is if you have misinformation being communicated. Um, if somebody's campaigning on misinformation, that's kind of gets kind of dicey. And usually the association, you know, gets involved and, and tries to correct any misinformation, but campaigning is okay under the law. Question number nine, is the association required to allow political assemblies for public office on community property? Is it possible to regulate or prohibit an owner from having their guests on property for a political assembly for public office who take up all of our parking spaces? Okay, these are all going to be kind of new questions when this new law goes into effect um, in September that allows for assembly, peaceful assembly. I do think that um, the association's rulemaking authority is going to address a lot of these issues. So if you anticipate that there are going to be political assemblies for public office. I'm not quite sure what that means, but maybe you have a candidate that comes and talks to your owners. I think I'm okay with that, um, as long as it's you know limited to the owners and not third parties. So a candidate coming and talking, I think that's totally fine. Um, but if you have outside people coming in, stressing your community by taking all the parking spots, that's something that you could regulate through rules that the statute allows you to do, then you will allow third parties to come in and just be for homeowners, et cetera. Okay, question 10. What are some examples of when a board can vote by email to have an action taken? What and how is that recorded? Okay, so there aren't very many actions. There aren't many examples of when a board should be voted by email because under the open meeting law in Arizona, 
all t- any time a quorum of the board is discussing association business, it needs to be an open board meeting where homeowners are notified 48 hours in advance of the meeting, given an opportunity to attend, listen, and participate at appropriate times. So having an email vote on something is violating the open meeting law. Now, there are a couple exceptions. Um, one exception would be in an emergency circumstance where, you know, we there's no way around. We have to make a decision. A tree just fell on the common area clubhouse and damaged the entire clubhouse. We need to make a quick decision of the board to notify our insurance carrier and make a claim. Um, and if you do something like that, that would be an emergency meeting by email. And you would just keep those emails and read into the record at the next regularly scheduled board meeting what happened attached to the meeting minutes, the emails, and reading the record what happened. So that, that's really the only example that I would say would be a time that the board can make decisions outside of a board meeting would be in an emergency, true emergency circumstance. Now, that being said, there are times where boards are communicating with each other. If it's less than a quorum that's communicating, that's fine. But the reply all to all board members making decisions, that's, you can't do that. Making a decision, even if it's the board president polling all five board members or four board members, and you know, to get a vote that that's also a violation of the open meeting law unless it's an emergency. But you know, discussing when we're going to have the next board meeting that's not a violation of the open meeting law because there's nothing you know substantial that's being discussed at association business. Here's the bids for the trees we're going to be discussing at the next board meeting. As long as you're not discussing it by email, you can exchange information like that. That's fine. Okay, next question. We have a member of the architectural committee that wants to knock on residents' doors and ask them what they think about their neighbor's architectural requests. What are your thoughts about this? Well, unless your documents require you to do that, I would really advise against that. Um, You know, all these meetings, if it's a regularly scheduled committee meeting, architectural committee meeting, and you have them regularly, it's an open meeting. Um, if you're and owners would be allowed to attend. That being said, I know there aren't that many open architectural meetings because lots of these architectural committees don't meet regularly, like the first Monday of the month. And so they're not required to have open architectural committee meetings. Unless your CCNR is required to do that, I think it is really opening up a can of worms. And I think it's going to create more problems for your association in the future. Question 12, does a city have to implement the short-term rental requirements or is it their choice? The way that I read the statute is that it's a requirement. Okay, question 13, if our condo association states we have a 30-day minimum rental, is that in effect? So I don't know, it's hard for me to answer this question because I don't know what your CCNR say. The CCNRs are going to be what's controlling. So the declaration or CCNRs, if it's st- if they state that there's a 30-day minimum rental period, then that's going to be enforceable. If just your board says, hey, it's 30 days minimum and it's not supported by the CCNRs, that's not going to cut it. That's not going to be enough under the statute. Okay, question 14. Since Sun City West is a census-designed community, all the short-term rentals refer to cities and towns. So what does that mean we could limit short-term rentals? I haven't really thought about that. So you're subject to county rules, I believe, in Sun City West. If I'm correct, I I don't know for sure. But I think that the counties are also going to be implementing rules, even though it it only says um, cities and towns. But I I anticipate that the, the counties will also be implementing similar rules. So I think you should be covered under that. Next question, number 15. When an owner or member sells their condo, does the condo owner have to notify the potential buyer that the property next door is a short-term rental? To short answer would be no. You don't. There is no requirement to do that. Question 16. Our community is made up of single-family homes and court homes. The board is dominated by single-family homeowners, with only one of the seven members being a court homeowner. The board continually shuts the court homes from being on the board. Is there anything the court home owners can do? Well, I got to look at the votes, right? I mean, I don't know how, how many votes there are, but votes in the community 
you know, make up the board. We need to organize the court homes owners so that they, you know, focus all their votes on a power of one or two vote just for court home members. I know there's going to have to be a strategy to try to get more court home owners on your board. Also, just getting the message out, even trying to convert some of the single family homeowners by campaigning, talking about fiscal responsibility and making good decisions for your community. That might be a way to convert some of the um, single family home homeowners to vote for you. Um, maybe you have a special expertise that you could bring to the board. Maybe you're an architect or an accountant or a lawyer or something. And, and that may make you more palatable as a candidate because you could offer advice and input to your association that would be beneficial. Um, so I guess what I would say is you need a strategy. If you want more people from the court homes to serve on your board, you need to organize the court home voters so that they vote. And you also need to try to woo or persuade the, the single family homeowners to also vote for you. Next question, number 17. Can the courts alter existing CCNRs regulations that are unrealistic or just amendments? So I think you're, you're talking about the new case here that we discussed here earlier, um, the Supreme Court of Arizona case. So, yes, there has to be a lawsuit first. So that's the prerequisite. So an owner would have to file a lawsuit asking that a certain provision in your CCNRs um, be struck down. Now, mind you, they're going to only have a certain period of time to do that because under the Condominium Act, after amendment is passed, owners have one year to challenge it. In a, con in a plant community, owners have six years to challenge it. So... You have to be in one of those windows in order to have the court bring out that blue line test and, and potentially blue line or change an amendment because they feel it's invalid. Let's see. So I think just to answer your question, I think it's amendments. So the ones that are more than a year in a condo at more than six years in a planning community, if the owner wouldn't be able to challenge those because the statute of limitations would have run. Okay. Can we require tenant information for every short-term visitor? So every short-term rental, yes. So anytime there's a new short-term rental, you can require the tenant information and you can make them pay the $25 fee. Question 20, can we use our bylaws to restrict rentals? So from a purely legal perspective, it, it really needs to be in the CCNRs um, because the bylaws are kind of the how to run the association and the CCNRs are the property restrictions. I mean, you can try to enforce that restriction on the number of rentals through your bylaws, but if it's challenged, I don't think you would. Question 21. I'm confused regarding short-term rentals. I thought I heard Beth say, if the HOA allows rental, they must allow all rentals, both short-term and long. And she said the HOA can restrict short-term rentals. Can you please clarify? Okay, so the bottom line for this particular question is that Look at your CCNR. What do they say on rentals? Do they have any minimum rental time periods? Do they say nothing about rentals? Do they prohibit rentals? Um, so if your CCNRs prohibit rentals, you know, that's, you can enforce that. If your CCNRs say that there's a minimum 30 day rental, you can enforce that. If your CCNRs don't say anything about rentals, the law says that owners should be allowed to rent and without any restriction. That's kind of the bottom line. Um, I hope that answers your question. Okay, question number 22. CCNRs were developed for our neighborhood when the development was first started. That was in 1979. They were amended once in 1980. Some of the CCNRs have not been enforced over the years. Not sure that copies of the original documents have been shared with new owners when homes are sold. Do CCNRs expire after a period of time? If not, as a neighborhood association, what is our responsibility relative to updating or enforcement? So I'd have to see the language of your CCNRs to see if there was any sort of an expiration date. Usually there is not. And I don't know if you're like a formal association or if you're more of like a neighborhood association. And I don't know if you have a management company that should be providing the CCNRs to any new buyer. That's like kind of a lot of questions that I have right now. So do the CCNRs expire after a period of time? I would guess no, but you'd have to look at your documents. 
Um, second part of that question is, as a neighborhood association, what is our responsibility relative to updating or enforcement? So neighborhood association may not be considered like a planning community. There's a legal definition for what makes you a planning community. Do you have mandatory assessments and does the association own common areas or, um, you know, there's a whole definition section you have to determine if you fit into. So I think you probably do need to talk to an attorney to, to determine do our documents need to be updated consistent with the changes to the Planning Communities Act um, or are we just a neighborhood association that's not a planned community and therefore maybe some of these changes don't even apply to us. Okay, question 23. Can the HOA request confirmation in writing that the tenant has reviewed the CCNRs along with the tenant's info on cars? So no, that would be an additional requirement making the tenant sign in writing that they reviewed the CCNRs and that's not something that the statute allows. Question number 24, we only have a couple more questions. Um, as a subdivision under a master association, can our sub HOA enact rules and regulations based on the master CCNRs, even if the sub CCNRs don't include a particular provision for a specific rule? For example, the master has a rule for trash can concealment, but the sub doesn't. Can the sub enact a rule for trash can concealment, which is the same or more restrictive than master's? Or is the sub not allowed to add this rule? It's really going to depend on what the master association's documents say. Sometimes it says specifically like that, hey, the master CCNRs control um, under all circumstances. In that case, then the master's rule for trash can concealment would be the rule that everybody would have to abide by. Um, I know for sure you can't adopt a different rule saying something that would be in direct contradiction to the master documents. Can you make it more restrictive? I don't know. I'd have to see how the master CCNRs address how the bars are written and what the relationship is, et cetera. Usually you just go with what the master's rules are on something like this. Okay, question number 25. With the rental registration fee of $25 and the late fee of $15, can you request the rental registration and add the fee to the owner's account and then fine them if they don't provide the registration or is it just one or the other and not both? So good question. The rental registration fee of $25, you have to notify the, the uh, landlord owner you know, of, of the fee and if they don't pay that $25, after you notify them in writing and give them 15 days to respond, then you can charge a late fee of $15. You can only fine, you can't fine anymore, you know, for not returning the forms or giving the information. You can only fine for violations of the CCNRs by the tenant and you'd be fining the landlord owner for violations such as not putting out trash cans or leaving them out too long or whatever. So that would be, you know, how you could fine the landlord owner. Um, the next part of this question is, can you do this every time we see a new tenant moving in? So yes, anytime there's a new tenant, we'll notify the landlord owner and the $25 fee will kick in again. We have an owner who owns several units in a townhome community who does not ever respond to rental registration requests, violation letters, and just allows the fines to sit on his account. I'm not sure what you mean by fines, but um, it really only could be the $25 plus the $15 after giving them 15 days notice. At this point, I think you really need to escalate this to your attorney to have your attorney send a letter to that owner, make sure that the owner is complying with it, escalate it to that, and then I think the owner will likely comply. Question 26. Um, during Zoom meetings, both management and the HOA board have shut down the chat room which in, a, in essence has also shut down communication between community members. Can this be stopped since at one time, the same board has made the decision to keep the chat room up and running? This really just depends, honestly. Um, different associations handle this differently. If it's a smaller meeting, the chat room can be manageable. If you have a really large meeting and there's you know hundreds of people, hundreds of stuff in the chat, it's hard. And, and then sometimes that's period. If the chat room is the chat room is out of control, that language attacking people, we need to shut that down. So ultimately the board does make the decision on this, but remember under the open meeting law, owners should be allowed to contribute before the board takes formal action on something. So they should be allowing the owners an opportunity to contribute 
if the board is voting on something. And so the chat room should either be enacted or owners should be allowed to unmute and contribute if they choose to do so at that time. Okay, we are on question 27. We have three more questions. The CCNR state that board meetings can take place without notice of time and place to members. How can I demand to be notified of the upcoming meeting? The open meeting law in Arizona requires that, um, and it doesn't matter what your CCNR state, the open meeting law controls here. The open meeting law says that anytime a quorum of board is meeting to discuss association business, that 48 hours notice must be given to the membership. And this can be done by conspicuous posting um, or any other reasonable means like putting it on the website or um, sending an email to owners or putting it in a newsletter. I think what I would do is notify your board that they're violating the open meeting law and demand that they start notifying the owners 48 hours in advance of the meeting. How do you confirm that the closed door executive board meetings were only addressing topics allowed under 331804 open meeting exceptions? Well, prior to going into executive session, um, your board is required to put either on the notice of the meeting or they need to announce prior to the meeting um, the topics that they're going to be discussing at the executive session. Um, and so what we recommend our boards to do that we work with is that when you're sending out the notice of the executive session meeting, that you place right on the notice what topics you're going to be discussing and what sections of the open meeting law, 331804, the executive session topics you're going to be discussing. And, and that's a requirement that you do that under the law. So how can you confirm, though, behind closed doors that they're not, you know, veering off and talking about a non-executive session topic? You can't. I mean, you have to hope that they're, you know, being responsible and complying with the law. The last question. Um, this is great because we it's we've already we're an hour and fifty seven minutes in. So, last question is: Our HOA's current restriction of rentals less than one hundred and eighty days is in one of our governing documents, but not in the CCNRs. We were preparing to amend the CCNRs to put an R-stated restriction. When Callaway, when the Callaway case was decided, our attorney has strongly advised that we pause this effort pending further legislative or judicial clarification, anticipating that challenges to any enforcement activity could or would lead to a costly or extended lawsuit. We have paused our efforts. What are your thoughts on this and how long should we wait? You already have it in your another governing document and not in your CCNRs. I'm assuming that owners are okay with it. I, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't, why would you pause here? I think you want to carefully word it. You want to carefully think about, are there owners that are going to challenge this? And if so, then, you know, maybe we want to consider putting a hold on it. Um, but honestly, I mean, it's going to take forever for legislation to be written that's going to undo gonna the language in Callaway. And so... Um, I wouldn't, I mean, basically you're going to be on pause for five years. I think what you need to do is get some use more proactive and, and think through here are the facts in our association. This is already in another government document. No one's complaining about it. What's the likelihood that someone's going to challenge this and then create an amendment that, you know, can withstand any challenge under the new Supreme court case and also use this as an opportunity to update the language in your documents to make um, amendments easier in the future as per the Callaway case. That would be the approach that I would have on it. Okay, so that's it for our time. We're um, 1259, so we've been online for almost two hours. Thank you so much for joining us here today for class number seven of our 2022 virtual HOA Condo Academy um, series. This is our seventh class for 2022. We're going to be keeping doing classes the third Thursday of every month for the rest of 2022. I'd also like to um, thank the different cities and towns and municipalities who are partnering with us to create these classes and provide these free educational opportunities. Thank you so much for your partnership over the years. Um, we have really enjoyed teaching these classes with you. Videos can be found on our website at mulcahylawfirm.com. Don't forget that we have our first Friday coming up here, which will be August. First Friday in August at 9 a.m. We'll be live answering your questions. So don't forget about that. Check out our website at mulcahylawfirm for more information on that. 
Take care, everybody. Stay cool and have a great rest of the summer. Don't forget our free cheat sheets are available for download at mulcahylawfirm.com. The antenna bar Zoom, Facebook Live, First Friday free call-in, videos and podcasts is to provide a forum for board members and community managers to receive answers to HOA and condo legal questions. Please note, the content in these sessions are general in nature and is not intended to and should not be relied upon or construed as legal opinion or legal advice regarding any specific issue or factual circumstance. You should directly consult with an attorney for advice regarding your individual situation.